Good evening to everyone. Uh, it's a beautiful November 26. It's a Friday. It's uh, 7.04 p.m. in the Philippines. Um, and although I have to introduce her uh, myself, I uh, would like to mention that uh, our guest speaker, uh, Lisa Marshall, is actually uh, in uh, uh, North Carolina right now, where she's actually based. And uh, it's 6.04 6 a.m. where she's at. Uh, on November 26 um, there. But before we get started, um, we will tell you about the house rules. Please keep your mics on mute mode to avoid unnecessary background noise during the discussion or, the, or this particular session. This lecture is simultaneously streamed in the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel. Um, and you may send your questions via Zoom chat box or through our social media accounts which will also be in Twitter and Facebook. And finally, at the very last uh, uh, part of this uh, program, we would really like it if, the, if you, will be, you will stick around to have a picture uh, with our guest speaker. The session will be recorded for document, documentation purposes. So let me introduce uh, our speaker for uh, this evening. Uh, Lisa Marshall, aside from being a very good friend, not only in graduate school at the University of North Carolina, and also as a, as a colleague at the uh, NC State University. And Lisa, I can't help but also mention this, this anecdote first before I give you the more formal stuff. When I was first teaching as a, as a teaching assistant professor at the International Studies Program of North Carolina University some 10 years ago, um, on my first day of teaching, I had an anxiety attack. And I, 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 it's rare because I've been teaching in the Philippines a few years before I went to the States. And so what I did was I went straight to Lisa's office at the nuclear engineering department and said, Lisa, I don't think I can make it today. I feel like I can't speak. And she said, breathe, <laughs> breathe <laughs> in and out. And I remember Darlene did the same thing to me the first time I taught uh, many years ago before that in UP when it was my very first time to teach. So thank you, Lisa and Darlene by extension too. Anyway, on to the business of introducing Lisa for you. She's the uh, inaugural director of the Outreach Retention and Engagement Program, as well as an advisor and co-advisor, if I may say that, and lecturer at the Department of Nuclear Engineering at North Carolina State University. Currently, she is the chair of the North Carolina State University Association of Women Faculty, as well as the associate director for the China Engineering Study Abroad Program before it got upended in, in the pandemic. She's been doing that for the last two years before the pandemic. Uh, she's the former board of director of the American Nuclear Society and an active member, if I may say that. Uh, last year, uh, she's the recipient of the 2020 American Nuclear Society Young Members Advancement Pro Award, uh, also the 2020 uh, North Carolina State Engineering Champion for Women uh, Award. Also, uh, two years before that, in 2019, NC State Outstanding Engagement Award, and, and a few years before that was the American Nuclear Society Landis Public Communications and Education Award and was inducted to a scientific research society called the Sigma Xi. She currently holds executive positions in the American Nuclear Society, as well as the American Society of Engineering Education, and finally, the American Association of Geographers. Lisa holds a master's degree in geography with a specialization in energy geography from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she holds a graduate certificate in GIS and is completing her PhD in higher education, specializing in engineering education from North Carolina State University. Friends, colleagues, guests, please join me in warmly welcoming Lisa Mar. Oh, before we do that, Lisa, let me just show you one thing. Uh, I, yes. We did, we did. We did have a, a word cloud courtesy of Dominic Amorsolo. And, I and love what we it. did was, yeah, right? It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> and when we asked for, for people to, uh, to register for your talk, this is the one that came out. Interesting, huh? Considering it it's, is, uh, it is, and it, it is. plays nicely into the, the, the collaborative work that we've done in post-apocalyptic um, yes, cinema. <laughs> cinema, right. <laughs> there's the apocalyptic, there's energy, there's power, there's subatomic waste ah. and a few other things that were in there. So, so really interesting. Um, 
friends. <laughs> Take two. Friends, colleagues, <laughs> uh, guests, uh, uh, help me or, or join me in welcoming a very good friend and colleague and speak, uh, our speaker for tonight or th this morning in North Carolina uh, to talk about the second modern nuclear renaissance in the making, positioning nuclear climate change and infrastructure, uh, Lisa Marshall from NC State University. Thank you so much, um, Joseph, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I have a few words at the very beginning that I wanted to share with you um, and then open it up for discussion because that's where everything happens, right? I think. Um, and now I'm trying to share and I cannot. Or maybe I'm just, oh no, I can. Never mind. You can. All right. <laughs> You got this. I've got this. Breathe. <laughs> All right. So um, I did some of my graduate studies work looking at the nuclear renaissance in 21st century back in 2000, 2001. And um, I'm still interested in it. And how does a industry, um, an enterprise um, define itself or and what are some of the mechanisms that um, are, have to be in place for that to happen? So when Joseph re reached out to me to, to do this symposium, this colloquium, um, I decided, let's look at the second modern nuclear renaissance. And I put those in quotes, and I'll explain later why, in the making, right? So um, what I want to do is look at the geography of energy and place nuclear within? What are some of the themes that lead up to this particular point? And where does my research fit? And then I wanna talk about the project itself, kind of the ever evolving geography of the US nuclear energy industry or enterprise. Um, and by extension, you are going to hear a bit about um, how the US situates itself globally as well in this, this larger than national um, enterprise some of the material and legislative productions that occur when one is talking about nuclear power. And then that question, right? The future of nuclear, um, the Renaissance, um, the revival of nuclear, and um, going to be looking at that through the lens of discursive analysis of nuclear en en energy, um, examining the mechanisms and also the messaging that is coming from the enterprise itself. I can't get through all in an hour. So these are some of my remarks, some highlighted relations to um, my, my research work and then um, my work work, my professional work as we're moving forward further into the 21st century, right? Um, I'm gonna highlight some future research, closing remarks, and then I say Q&A, that's the discussion part for us all. So, what are some of the themes, right? When you look at energy geography as a whole, you have um, a focus in on, on fossil fuels. They dominate the literature, um, both descriptive and then also analytically. Whether we're talking about post-war economic growth um, and the need for, for energy, or we're situating it in kind of the capitalist production and circulation um, uh, discussion. Um, there is treatment in the literature of looking at regional uh, manifestations and what that does to a particular area. Um, there is discussion also about how energy and society relates and what goes into the energy discussion making. And I put here some of the scholars and um, some of the years, but this theme runs through starting um, starting in these particular um, years, but continues on in the literature. We also see a discussion of energy security, first as it relates to OPEC and the, the 1973 embargo. Uh, we also have a discussion of this energy security as it relates to the Cold War and then rising powers, right? Outside of kind of Europe and North America, the United States, particular emphasis on China and India. And then emerging nuclear. What are some of the nation states that are thinking about um, doing some of the initial um, 
research evaluations as to whether nuclear belongs in their energy mix into that energy portfolio. Later on, you have these continuing themes around renewables, um, in particular, how do we get to renewables, right? So you have um, your fossil fuels, what is in, what is situated as a transitionary energy source. And some of the literature for geography looks at um, nuclear as situated in this location. Now, when you talk to the proponents of nuclear, they are, are, are kind of situating themselves um, with the renewables, right? Part of that solution for climate change, for economic growth, et cetera, for, for national security. Um, and then there's discussion on environmental impacts, right? Um, at the particular site, then also looking at that particular town, city, region, and then nationally as a whole, and internationally, because then you have the discussion of non-proliferation issues as we, as we use the technology um, for energy, right? Um, energy production. And then there is another stream within the literature that looks at energy poverty, weatherization, right? Energy inequality, and how to address that. All right, so nuclear in the literature, right? In particular energy geography. Again, it's seen as this transitional power source, right? Um, the, the discussion around who are the, the world nuclear powers um, and what responsibilities do they have overall? Um, and you start to see some of that literature talk about um, non-proliferation or proliferation um, issues. You're also looking at it as a resource and the, the siting, the land use, the impact assessment, um, and a move away from energy production to also discussing energy dis distribution. And by the 80s or so, you see more work on risk perception and energy behavior, especially after Three Mile Island and then also Chernobyl. Later on in the literature, you start to see um, a treatment of Fukushima as another national accident uh, caused by a tsunami that that relation to climate change, but also um, as a part of a questioning of whether there should be a continuance of um, the use of the technology, both in Japan, in the region, and then also nationally. So um, there's some discussion also within the literature on radioactive waste. Um, what do we do with it? Where um, the power to name a particular location, is that location a, a, uh, a settled location, right? So Wayne Wright back in 2003 talked about scientific practices that may make a territory of the states appear stable, uncontested, and complete. And the questioning of that stableness, that, um, that completeness, definitely comes through in the literature when one is looking at Yucca Mountain, kind of the national repository for spent fuel and radioactive waste coming from not only the energy, um, stream, but then also from medicine, weaponry, et cetera. What you do see also in the, in the literature is looking at um, uh, nuclear energy in the larger discussion as a response to global warming, right? And, um, and, and climate change as a whole. Now, there's a renewed interest in the 2000s, and that's where I, I kind of step in to my own right, right in, 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 as a researcher in this space, looking at the politics and the language of nuclear. So we're still talking about the material, but then also we're talking about the making, the creation, the recreation of nuclear. What, some of the, what is the rhetoric around nuclear energy as a whole? Um, if you haven't read uh, the book by Gabrielle Hetz, 
please, like, please, please take a look at it. It's looking at nuclearity, right? The claims of nuclear nationalism, the nuclear world order, environmental stewardship through nuclear energy as a whole. Um, it's, it's still one of my most favorite um, scholarship work on, on nuclear. And then you begin to see the use of the word renaissance, right? Um, in the 2000s, and that then kind of piggybacks on what's going on in the industry that I'll, I'll mention shortly. And um, typically, one looks at the nuclear fuel cycle, the end product of uh, the uranium fuel cycle, the mining component, becomes the beginning part of the nuclear fuel, fuel cycle. And you're beginning to see uh, in the literature more of a treatment that they're, they're not separate, but there's a continuum and that we have to look at the uranium fuel cycle if we are going to talk about this nuclear in energy geography. Jasanoff and Kim begin to talk about more succinctly about the social technical imaginaries, right? How does the technology evolve into different nation states. And they look at it from South Korea and comparing it to the United States. So there very much is a combination of rhetoric and reality, uh, materiality that exists when one is thinking of nuclear in energy geography. So where do I fit in, right? My research aims to add to the description and then also to the analysis of how nuclear energy is co-produced. And this is in relation to other uh, and parts of the energy sector, the environment, and then the society as a whole. Um, what is a place, what place does nuclear energy occupy? What actions are taken by the nuclear energy proponents? There's quite a bit of literature out there from the anti-nuclear movement, the social movement, also from individuals taking a look from the outside in. Um, and I, I've been fortunate enough to be inside in the creation of um, your, your technologies as well as your workforce. Um, and then some of the outreach work that is being done to the general public and then in the, in the pre-college space. Um, so what are those actions and wanting to, to unpack them, right? And then the fact that there are um, externalities, right? And how does that impact the nature of a discussion around energy? And there are many aspects of that. I'm not gonna go through all of them in this talk. And if you, if you want to chat about one that I, you know, I didn't get to, please in the, the Q&A, the discussion, we can do so. So I'm examining the 21st century framing and reframing of nuclear energy by its proponents. I'm trying to study the making of nuclear energy as an active material and discursive process. And I wanna understand how nuclear energy is remade in space through geographically specific um, constructions of the past, the present and the future. Um, I'm proposing that it, there is a geography of nuclear necessity that has evolved and is being utilized by the enterprise, right? Um, this necessity is, um, is in uh, nuclear energy to make it part of the energy mix if the United States and many other um, established and um, emerging nuclear nation states are to meet their obligations for electrification and its distribution to the economy, to society, and the environment as a whole. And this necessity has traversed several real and material boundaries, right, in making and remaking. And this is very much about a remaking um, uh, exercise so that it occupies a space of resiliency and as well as relevance. relevance. I'm going to pause for a second just to make sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for putting her, the, the text in the, in the chat. All right. 
I follow this quote everywhere in all that I do, right? Only by participating with others can researchers better understand lived, sensed, experienced, and emotional world, emotional worlds. So it's just not the physical and the actual action, but then there's also the emotion, the, the sensibilities that are associated with what is being done. Um, so my research is very much participant observation. Um, I had gotten the job uh, within the nuclear department before I started my graduate studies. And I, I can remember it clear as day, that eureka moment of, oh, wait a minute, I've got my study right here, right? Um, and then um, discursive analysis, right? The claims made and actions taken in producing in nuclear. And it takes many forms, right? So I did look at and I continue to look at presidential directives, looking at industry reports, legislation, infographics, um, videos, and the response to the anti-nuclear arguments, right? And I'm in that room. I am in that room having that discussion about um, the, the technology itself and its utility and how then do we express this to the larger, larger population. I have and will continue to do semi-structured interviews as well. They're illustrative, not comprehensive, but then that gets to that live sensed and emotional world um, uh, that um, my subjects live in, right? And that I live in. Um, and then also my positionality, there are pros and cons to that, right? Um, I have built up trust. Uh, so the, the, the conversation is at a different level. The questions that I ask um, and uh, are answered, um, and I, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a more nuanced, more deep um, discussion that is had. Um, I'm versed in, I wouldn't say that, that I could build a nuclear or operate a nuclear reactor, but the technical language and understanding that technical language, that technical scientific language and what the words mean um, and the, the, the more accurate definition of some of those, those words and concepts. And then it's an insider view. And that then in itself brings some, some disadvantages. Am I too close to the subject matter? Um, and I'm constantly being reflective on, on my position and the work that I do. So the project. When you look at world nuclear reactors, we're looking at 10% of the world's energy coming from that source, approximately 440 40 power reactors worldwide. It's the second largest source of low carbon um, power, about 29% in, in 2018. Um, the first one being hydroelectric. Over 50 countries utilize nuclear energy in research reactors as well, right? And you're also seeing it in the production of medical and industrial isotopes and also being used in, 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 in training. The, the, the breakup by region, um, the fastest growing is in Asia. And when we look at the construction, um, there was a peak in the, in the 70s and 80s of 186 that were um, completed and or underway. And you see that there is a, a lull in the 90s and 2000s, but then you see the, the um, kind of your um, legislation and um, investment in nuclear that starts again um, begins 2000, 2001, um, and there is an upswing again that occurs. And at its peak, we're looking at about 64 that were completed or under construction. Um, right now, as of July 2021, you're looking at 53 that are under construction or underway. So where are these new builds? Definitely China, India, and South Korea kind of leading the way. Russia not, and Turkey, UAE, not too far behind. 
But when you, you, you look at nation states that have decided to have it as part of its energy mix and to answer some of the climate issues, China is leading, right? And all of these that are under construction are to be completed by or before 2030. The top 15 nuclear energy producers, the United States, France, Russia, South Korea, Canada are the top five. What we are seeing is that there are generations of nuclear power, right? And more efficient, less fuel being used, um, a smaller footprint. And then we're at the cusp of almost a, a uh, leapfrogging in the use of the technology or the type of technology. So for the United States, you're looking at in the 50s, your prototype, your demonstration reactors, the bills happen that were part of Gen 2, two as well as Gen 3, um, still very much using active safety mechanisms. Um, and then in the 2000s, you have the construction of what is known as your Gen 3 plus reactors, passive safety uh, implemented there within. Especially after um, Fukushima, there was a questioning of current plants as well as these new construction. Um, will they be able to withstand such things as a, a tsunami? Um, and uh, with that, you had a stressing of the passive safety systems that were in place compared to the need to have someone there at all times. Um, the AP1000s for AP1000, for example, and this is being built in, in, in China, in the United States. Um, the idea of if there was to be a tsunami, um, would it continue to operate safely, right? Um, and uh, some of the analysis of what had happened in, in um, Japan, um, if an AP1000 was there, um, you hear from Westinghouse, um, the, the producers, uh, that it would have been able to um, continue to operate for 72 hours without external um, intervention. So it's very much the argument being made um, in the 2000s as you have the new bills of safety and security, right? And then Gen 4, the, the, the talk about having um, an, another type of reactor that would then um, meet the needs of a changing society. And um, include more nation states that didn't need the large projects, so to speak, right? Um, but something else, smaller modular reactor and your micro reactors, your fast reactors. So for the small modular reactors, the idea is that you have flexible electricity, right? It, was, it would be load following. As the needs increase, there would be a ramp up as there is not a need, it, they would all be going in the opposite direction. And then there's this cogeneration, the use of the steam um, for district heat as well as for industrial heat. So looking at, at the United States being the largest producer of nuclear power, and it accounts for more than 30% of worldwide nuclear generation of electricity, um, it, it it favors us taking a closer dive into what is going on in the United States, right? So um, as of 2020, I think this was October, well, it was updated October um, 2021, 19.6% of our power comes from nuclear. And then when you look by state, there are some states without nuclear power as part of the energy mix and others where it has more prominence. So within North Carolina, you're looking at 32% of our power coming from um, nuclear. And then South Carolina, which is the, just the border across, you it jumps up to 56%. There are 93 operating nuclear reactors in 23 states, right? Um, you had in the mid 2000s about 16 license applications to build 24 new reactors. 
Um, it is capital intensive. Um, and because uh, a, a lot of the electricity is sold wholesale and it's a liberalized environment from, for, um, I guess it would be your northern um, mid states, um, you see that, that funding for these projects was difficult to gain. And thus, we only have two right now um, that are being built within the United States. One, which was um, started but not completed, um, Watts Bar in Tennessee. So Watts Bar 2 has been added here. Um, so at the start of this, you had four and then five. Um, the, uh, the two that were in South Carolina stopped for that very reason, the capital intensive um, and a decision made by um, the engineering firms as well as the utility owning that particular site not to complete it. And then you have Watts Bar 2 that was completed and Vogel 3 and 4 uh, is, is nearing completion at this particular point. So one of the contexts for all of this development, right? Um, in 2000, you had former VP Cheney, this is under the Bush era, uh, led um, the National Energy Development Group. And that then spurred on the Energy Policy Act of, of 2005. And then when you look at that legislation in particular, Title IX, Subtitle E, um, speaks specifically about nuclear energy. There are seven sections, and you see this in other legislation uh, addressing these particular issues, um, and then also a capital injection um, to move us to the next level of, of construction and also research and development and into um, newer technologies or the advancement of technologies that have been researched, right? So research and development, most definitely funding allocation, looking at the efficiency of present and future nuclear system. What does that fuel management look like? What are some of the um, collaborative um, initiatives between kind of your, your organizational, national laboratories, government organizations, and universities. Safety and security, always in there. Um, and then also seek alternatives to radioisotopes in industry, in industry where it's not needed, right? Um, so there's a concentration on um, efficiency, on impact, um, and, and because we've used this technology in a number of different ways, if it's not needed, if there's a better technology out there to pull back. A nuclear necessity project is, was on the, on the way, is on, on the way, right? And it dates back to early 2000s. You've got nuclear power um, 2010, and this is a government industry cost sharing in the hopes of spurring new construction. And we did see that happen, um, both within the United States and then also uh, looking outwardly um, into the world and US companies being part of the bidding for the construction in other spaces. In 2005, there is advanced fuel cycle initiatives as well. Um, it, the fuel cycle is an open one. It's not closed. So we're not recycling, we're not reprocessing within the United States. And so I'll look at, wait a minute, can we close and how do we go about closing the fuel cycle and continuing that research in that space? You also had the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. So um, outwardly looking in the sense of, well, we would want other nations to purchase our particular technologies. Um, but then the question of how, can, how do you make this a proliferation resistant um, enterprise, right? A partnership. And you look at the Obama Bodhi um, discussion in 2015, so that industrializing nations would be supplied with the fuel necessary 
um, but um, they would not engage in enrichment or reprocessing. So that stream of making sure or trying to, to make sure that there is not a prolifer proliferation risk. And as we know, that, that stalled, <laughs> right? Um, because then you're looking at the, the, the rights of nations um, the rights of nations and then also uh, an understanding that then there is this dependency on another nation for one's energy and that has an impact on one's development in addition to one's national security. Um, in 2007, you also have the Energy Independence and Security Act. Um, and that then is the United States actually looking inwardly and realizing that there are other um, nuclear powers out there that um, have continued with the technology much faster than we have. Um, and then uh, you have a change, right? You've got change of government, you have a second the term of Obama here in the United States and the idea of this all the above energy strategy very much talking about energy security, low carbon energy, um, and then also what impact does that have um, on jobs? The whole idea of a clean energy future and the jobs associated with that as we're moving into COP21. There are a number of other ones, right? You have the gateway for um, accelerated innovation in nuclear gain. And that happened in 2016. Um, and this was to give access to the technical, regulatory, and financial port support necessary for the current fleet, but then also new reactors, advanced reactors. Uh, you've got the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act of 2018. And this was an amendment of the Act of 2005, right? Um, and it is there to help with costs and ex the expanding scientific progress and research that is happening at universities, through government, at national laboratories, and in the private sector. In the private sector, and that's where you begin to see this development for the fast test reactors as well. Um, in 2018. We're globally looking outward, and we're always looking outward, but I'm picking these particular um, legislations as well as initiatives to show the continuance of nuclear and the building of nuclear. Um, out, some of it within the public eye, and then others, you know, we're just continually working on these, these aspects. So nuclear innovation, clean energy future, nice. And this particular effort is, um, was spearheaded by the United States, Canada, and Japan. And the idea is to make sure that nuclear energy is included in any of the high level clean energy talks, right? You have um, the NERIC um, established at Idaho National Laboratory. And this then is moving us to a need to accelerate the demonstration and deployment of advanced nuclear um, energy, right? Um, that, that we'll have a demonstration reactor by 2025, 2030 or so. In the private industry space, you have um, GE's global, well, GE Hitachi's global nuclear fuel and X Energy, another engineering firm. Um, joining forces to produce low cost, high quality trizzle fuel. And we're looking at that. Um, now we're moving from commercialization in your residential and industrial space to also look at the Department of Defense for micro reactors as well. Um, as well as looking at um, colonies outside of this hemisphere or right. Um, this hemisphere, right? So looking at NASA and its nuclear thermal propulsion um, requirements. Recently in the news, they, there was a report of um, a nuclear reactor on the moon, right? And you have kind of looking at colonies in um, 
on Mars, right? And what would be that energy source? So it is very much integrated into not only um, life on Earth, right, and the commercial and residential space, but then also micro reactors, that portable reactors that the Department of Defense may need, um, and then also remote communities, and then looking at our extraterrestrial um, journeys. And then in 2019, you had an announcement as well of the versatile test reactor, right? Um, this is capable of performing irradiation testing. Um, it's also part of that larger project for the testing for advanced reactor fuels, materials, the instrumentation, and sensors. For this, this is definitely funding and fundamental research and um, a demonstration and leading into the scale up that would be necessary for the next generation, the next sets of designs. A few other things, um, Terra Power and X Energy um, in 2020 were selected to demonstrate their advanced reactors. So what you were seeing is a number of new companies on the block, so to speak, as opposed to the, the large um, Westinghouse and, and um, GE, et cetera. They're still continuing in the space, but you did see the evolution of, of, of other smaller companies that with this direct focus in on the advanced reactors. New Scale is demonstrating, um, building one at Idaho National Lab in Idaho, um, and possible bill for Puerto Rico. So you begin to see emerging nation states um, doing feasibility studies and, and, and making a connection that this next generation of reactors may be how um, they diversify their particular energy mix. And Biden rejoins the Paris Agreement as soon as he is elected um, and his approach is a whole of government approach for serious climate action that is necessary and carbon free energy sources to be available. So with that, you see transitionary energy source is squarely within um, the grouping of renewables and the industry, the enterprise, nuclear enter enterprise is very much situating itself as part of, of that grouping. Um, and then what, two weeks ago, a week ago, we had the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was signed, a bipartisan um, bill. And um, what you're seeing is there is capital put into the enterprise overall about clean energy and the clean energy future, and also specifically naming nuclear. Just as in 2005, you had um, your Title IX that talked about nuclear energy. We see that again in this recent act. So in tangent um, with this legislation, policies, economic initiatives, organizations are making themselves relevant, right? Um, and targeting policymakers, their districts and the public at large to get that information out. Nuclear discourse, discourse plays out through um, your policy statements that are put out by the American Nuclear Society, infographics that are initially started, you saw a number of them by Case Energy that rolled into become Nuclear Matters as an organization. Um, press releases, blogs, v blogs, um, coming out from trade organizations, from professional organizations, from private companies, right? Um, opinion polls done internally, in addition to those that are done external to the nuclear enterprise, Biscotti Research in particular. Um, media ads in targeted areas, right? So um, you'll find them primarily in the Northeast. You're looking at the DC and surrounding areas. Um, I've seen a few in the southeastern area as well. Editorials by proponents of nuclear, right? Um, and then trying to increase the coverage overall. 
You're also seeing action through Capitol Hill campaigns. So there are concerted efforts to have audience with staffers and with, legislat with legislators, um, both on the federal level and then also on the state level. And then K-12 outreach, right? The pre-college outreach and an integration into the curriculum as you see an integration of renewables um, into the curriculum at that, at that level. The messages are reflective and relational, right? Um, they talk of social benefits, the narrative of clean air, job creation, economic growth, um, energy diversification, and how do we tackle climate change? These are the, these are the messaging. So it's moved from uh, talking about the, the, the technology um, particulars um, or not talking about it at all, basically keeping one's heads down and doing the work and not, in, not having any engagement to very much being about engagement and finding the language to connect with individuals, to have a discussion as to why nuclear energy needs to be in this very public space. Um, there are also an amplification of um, scientists that were not necessarily for nuclear um, and what they, their change of heart and what that means. So you have, for example, Dr. Moore, formerly of Greenpeace, um, making a statement that they got it wrong by lumping nu nuclear weapons with nuclear energy. So you see this decoupling or the, the attempt at decoupling from um, weaponry and other enterprises, proliferation issues, and very much talking about the benefits of nuclear energy. You have infographics, the top 10 facts or the top 10 myths. Um, Southern came out with a, a, um, a video and I'm going to attempt to play it here for you. Sam here, Southern Company's chief answer guy. Today's question, what do gumballs have to do with nuclear energy? Well, as it turns out, nuclear energy is generated from gumballs. Well, little pellets about the same size anyway. And each of these little bite-sized bundles of brawn can pump out as much energy as 126 gallons of oil, 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, or even one ton of coal. 2,000 pounds. That's like a baby elephant. Pretty remarkable, huh? But what's even more remarkable is the way they crank out the energy. We're talking 24-7, rain or shine, at a super low cost. We get all that energy with no greenhouse gases. It's a clean, safe, reliable, and affordable energy source. And to make sure this amazing little energy source keeps pumping out the megawatts, billions are being invested in Plant Vogel in Georgia, the first new U.S. nuclear power construction in more than 30 years. The fact is, at Southern Company, we're always working, exploring, and innovating, coming up with new ways to provide customers with safe, reliable, affordable energy. And nuclear is an important piece of the puzzle. So let's recap. Powerful, check, clean, you bet. And safe, we wouldn't have it any other way. All that amazing energy from one gumball. Yeah, chew on that. So I play that to show that the industry is realizing that there needs to be some sort of connectedness to the general public, right? You want to get information out in a particular way and um, um, kind of taught the, the benefits um, as well as giving some, some of these, these factual information in a very relatable way. So I, I played that as one of the examples, and there are quite a few out there. Um, and then also you have, as we moved into um, COP26, a very deliberative campaign on Instagram um, and um, a connection to larger 
issues, societal issues, international issues. Um, for example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them, and the World Nuclear Association um, makes a connection with each and every one. So I just kind of did a screenshot for, uh, for these particular goals and that connectedness that is being done. So um, for poverty, we're looking at nuclear provides reliable and affordable low carbon energy. So it's part of that solution, right? Um, as we march towards zero hunger, um, we're looking at the technology that will help with pest control. For good health and well being, we're using the technology in the medical space for diagnosis as well as treatment. And it goes on and on in this particular fashion. Um, the pro nuclear energy enterprise is publicly increasing its outreach as well, right? As we look at um, uh, the pre college space, um, Navigating Nuclear was launched by American Nuclear Society. Gosh, is it a decade old now? Don't quote me on how old it is. Um, uh, the idea of bringing the technology in a uh, relatable way, in a more bite-sized way um, to the curriculum for ranging from middle school, well, elementary, all the way through to high school. A day in the life of the atom. Harvest to home, what role does, does nuclear play? Lesson plans, um, field trips into areas that are seen as in the past, this black box, right? You pass by a power plant, what goes on inside? So now you're having um, your, your, your workers, in, you're being invited into a tour of an operating research reactor of a national laboratory that's doing the fundamental research and development into the universities um, to, to, to tour um, what goes on behind the door of various laboratories. And then there was a usage of um, discovery channel Discovery education and discovery education has a penetration into the pre college space of 50% of all high schools have and utilizes um, this discovery education channel. Um, and the development of curriculum that then would be put in and have access to or provide access to um, an understanding of the technology itself and its benefits through this particular medium. So we're at a crossroads, most definitely, right? I've done some semi-structured interviews, um, trying to get a cross-section from within the industry, varying ages, gender, ethnicities, seniority levels, um, and trying to link um, or make a linkage with the policies, the legislation, the business practices, the messaging of the, the organizations and what we've heard. So I'm gonna give you a couple of highlights of this, right? So why is nuclear important was one of my kind of overarching questions. And these are some of what these interviews gleaned. Right, unsung contributions. It's a matter of non polluting versus fossil fuels. It frees us from foreign sources, cleaner air, um, less uh, expense, source, of source for developing nations. Um, there is a connection with the Atoms for Peace, the UN Atoms for Peace um, uh, presentation that was done by, by President Eisenhower back in 1953, right? Um, and I found that this one in particular, it's a moral imperative, 20 years of testing reactors, managing fuel sources, and the rapid transition to a sustainable technology. So you see that there's very much relational politics at play. The other is that communication, especially public perception of the, the, the technology. These are some of the challenges that were brought up in these interviews. The science of nuclear energy does not matter. It is a perception problem. Interviewees called it an unfair, unreasonable fear, called for an educational approach. 
um, targeting kind of your textbooks, technical challenges around accidents and their implications. Who are the knowledge experts and what are their messaging, right? Um, uh, very much associating it with uh, low gas prices and subsidies on the renewables as a challenge that nuclear had to, to overcome. Um, that our challenges are solvable and for the most part occupy a non-technical realm. So you see the gambit of the challenges from the experts themselves, what they see as the issues, and then there is a concerted effort to address many of them through professional organizations, through universities, through national laboratories, and the messaging ac accordingly. I also asked, what is the role of a nuclear, a nuclear engineering, a nuclear scientist, prof science professional? Um, there is an advocacy needed at higher levels this is what they they have identified um, and if we are going to develop nuclear power plants and the technology for the us and to share it externally right we advocate outside job in a non-nerd way and understanding that um, talking technical constantly um, with individuals you're not connecting um, with the hearts and minds that you, you want to have influence over. Um, and that it needed to be conversational, right, about this very complex technology um, and that the use of technical expertise in sharing information with the public and that transformation of that technical into that conversational was necessary and it was the role or is the role of the professional to do so and to be engaged in it so the professional cannot remain in the lab cannot remain doing that primary research that that professional has to come out of the lab as well and then on the topic of politics um, the idea that that the future of nuclear belongs in several political spaces, an understanding that it's not only at the state level, but then also at the local level. And you're seeing it more so also in the international level, right? With the COP um, meetings, especially COP26. And that politicians seek only to uh, see only risks, not benefit. Politics and industry are off cycle. The long cycle, for the technology it says it's itself 10 years to design a reactor but early research and development is in the annual funding basis so um, how then do we have impact on politicians to fund this long pro long project that they will not necessarily see the benefits of um, when the next election cycle comes around so ultimately, there's a guarded optimism for the future of, of nuclear. We're seeing the economic incentives. Um, you're also seeing an, an increased engagement with the public in a relatable way. Um, but it is still very guarded, right? Um, the first nuclear renaissance described as um, overestimated, overstated, I should say, um, since it was dependent on the economy and it was affected by the cost of natural gas. Um, it, it's a revival, but still not holding its own, right? Um, Fukushima um, caused a, pa a pause in that kind of the, the, the forward march that was occurring. It is happening internationally, and China um, is given as that example. Um, yes, 75 years of this field, no darkness in way of electricity, nuclear medicine, industrial radioisotopes. So for some, um, that renaissance happened even before the 21st century, and we're just plugging away. So what are my some concluding remarks from kind of an overview of the legislation, the economic initiatives, and some of the interviews? Understanding the practice of nuclear science provides insight into the physical as well as the social construction of the technology. 
um, it provides a geography of what is considered a high risk technology. Um, where is science practice? It's in the technology itself, but it's also in the rhetorical language of the text and of the people. And um, you have to assess some of the variables and intersections involved in the US nuclear energy enterprise industry to provide what Doreen Massey would deem a story thus far. So it's not a complete answer. You know, I, I pose at the beginning, are we in a nuclear renaissance question mark? Well, depends, right? There are elements of it that is occurring. And what we do as energy geographers um, gives the story thus far. So my own assessment is that the US nuclear industry lies between endurance and cautious expansion, right? Um, the industrial actors are increasingly engaged. The industry has positioned itself as an essential contributor to the reduction of carbon emissions, reliable energy production, and national security. And that comes through and is repurposed with different language but at its, its basis, it's validating a claim that nuclear energy has a necessity despite its, its stated challenges. So what's my next phase of all of this, right? I want to continue to look at this revival, this renaissance, especially the Biden years, especially with the the, the, um, the act that uh, was passed about two weeks ago. Regional and economic development and where does nuclear fit within it? And um, it has different representations depending on which part of the US you're looking at and then what part of the world that you're looking at as well. I am also very much interested in emerging and expanding nuclear states. Um, looking specifically at African countries um, with their large deposits of uranium. Um, and then also, as Dr. Pallas mentioned at the very beginning, I do study abroad in China. Um, I teach an energy geographies class there. Um, and seeing at the growth of nuclear within China and in the South, South um, Asian states as well, and the relationship between them. I end now by showing some of the Instagram um, uh, campaigns that have been given by the American, primarily the American Nuclear Society, right? So you're looking at COP26, um, Net Zero Needs Nuclear, and there is a collaboration between American Nuclear Society, um, Young Generation Nuclear, Nuclear International. Um, also here you're seeing, uh, I guess this would be this one here in way of positioning ourselves with renewables. Um, and then the others are talking about the benefits, right? So you're tucking your child in um, a very tender moment and the light that is utilized, the heating or the cooling, nuclear is part of that. Um, you're binge watching of videos, right? Where um, you're, saving a, you're saving a forest and a, a comparison with other renewables um, as well as fossil fuel for uh, the use of your technology your television and, and entertainment. And then once again, talking about the, the future of nuclear, not only here on earth, but in space travel and how, um, I, I'll leave it at that, at, at space travel, right? So you're seeing nuclear um, present in spaces um, that not normally you will find it, and then also the messaging has changed from purely technical to talking more about the benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was wonderful, wonderful, insightful talk. And uh, before I ask you one quick, uh, 
before I address one question here in the Zoom chat, I just wanted to say a few things about your presentation. Thank you for giving us a, uh, uh, shall we say, holistic and definitely multidimensional, multifaceted way of looking at nuclear energy. I believe many people still uh, conflate nuclear energy with nuclear weapons and mm -hmm. uh, the no nukes. Uh, we spoke about this uh, in the past, but maybe this is something maybe you can touch on later on. Also about uh, certain kinds of assumptions that nuclear weapons and all this uh, dystopian kind of landscape that uh, depicted in, in films and TV series and pretty much any narrative has been con um, always conflated with nuclear energy without realizing two very different things or multiple different things, right? Um, I also like to, to, to mention that uh, uh, this idea of showing the first nuclear narrative, nuclear renaissance and the second nuclear renaissance in the era of, of uh, advanced globalization, as well as uh, uh, the need for environmental protection has really reached, uh, I don't know if it's called an apex at this point, it's probably an overextension to say it that, but at the same time, it's also interesting to see how it has been also synonymous with the uh, kind of clean energy, sustainable mm -hmm. and, and affordable um, kind of energy that most people are actually um, uh, deriving from, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and let me just say this quick quote real, uh, real quick before I call on the question by Ms. De La Cruz is, uh, uh, I remember when, when you and I many years ago presented a paper on, on post-apocalyptic cinema focused on films that were, um, were nuclear uh, uh, narratives or stories were actually set. Right. And we were looking at how some of them show very, very different uh, stories in themselves, right? A boy and his dog to nine right. and finally to the road, you know, right? Yeah. That, that film that we did in, in, that also kind of question whether there's a new way of looking at how we, we look at um, uh, post-apocalyptic apocalyptic landscape in the era of nuclear energy that may or may not uh, encourage certain kinds of thinking, uh, mm -hmm. whether for better or for worse. That's um, right. Anyway, that's right. I, I have, there's a question for you from Ms. La Cruz and she said, um, uh, good evening, uh, good morning, good evening, Ms. Marshall, thank you for a very for such a great and interesting talk. I have a question. What are some steps that the companies are doing to ensure affordable nuclear energy for consumers if the industry requires sizable investment or capital? Right, so your current fleet, you're seeing that those utilities having some sort of um, uh, use of monies um, to offset the, the rising cost of, of electricity, right? And electrical bills um, for its clients. Um, and then looking very closely at the small modular reactors, right? Because it's a smaller footprint, more efficient fuel, um, and the cost itself um, for construction is much smaller, right? Compared to these, these big, um, projects that we have been building worldwide. Um, also, there is the role of your consumer advocates, right? Um, where I am, it is a um, public commission that sets the rates. And it's not necessarily the same way um, all through the United States, and you have different models worldwide, right? Um, those um, consumer advocates have played an essential role in making sure that your utilities or pressuring your utilities to have some sort of mechanism in place for consumers as the, the cost overall increases. Um, so it's a combination of the utilities themselves realizing this as well as your advocates realizing it. And then um, as your big projects kind of wind down and eventually we will not be renewing um, their license to operate, 
uh, there is a, a close look at your small mod smaller modular reactors um, and the role that they will play uh, in kind of the, the production and the distribution of our energy overall. There is a follow-up question here for you, Lisa, before I uh, bring in the other question, but were there key okay. factors that you were able to observe in the top countries utilizing and constructing nuclear power plants? That is, do they have, for example, do they have more nuclear-friendly policies, do they have more energy demand, and so on? All of the respond. above. <laughs> they were not making it easy for me at all. All of the above, <laughs> all of the above. Um, but you do need to have a, a nuclear-friendly environment um, for a discussion around um, nuclear power, nuclear energy, being part of the energy portfolio. Right, um, most definitely. And then as we are marching, right, very quickly um, to a point of no return in way of um, the warming of the environment and the, the effects of, of that of warming climate, um, you're seeing that there is a, a, a demand um, that is being made by um, your industry and then by certain, um, I guess it would be, uh, how would I describe that, that group? Um, general public or organizations that are saying that we've got to figure out how we change how we get electricity. And we need to take a closer look at the renewables, right? Um, and then there's the argument that comes up, well, um, the sun doesn't shine 24 hours or the wind doesn't blow 24 hours. So what else needs to be in that mix? Um, we've dammed up most of the, the hydroelectric locations um, worldwide. So it, it, nuclear is part of that. Um, and and to, to understand the technology a little bit better, know that it's not the technology that we started with. Um, the, even the, the older plans are not, um, when you think older plants, you think inefficiencies, but um, those older plants have been um, keeping up, so to speak. They have over 90 percent capacity factors associated with them. That need to utilize that as part of the strategy towards um, uh, reducing emissions, um, holding the, the increase in, in temperature overall and the, the, the effects of if we don't do so. So there's a, this demand that is coming. There is also a need for the policies to be nuclear friendly. Um, and then there are other factors that come into play that uh, impact whether nuclear is a serious contender or not. They're not making it easy. <laughs> I can imagine. There's, a, there's this um, question here with the rise of awareness about being more responsible and taking care of the environment, what do you think is the outlook of government opinion in terms of nuclear waste management? I guess mm -hmm. uh, can be US, can be Canada, uh, or any other case study you wanted to focus on? Yeah, no. Um, I, and that's why I like looking at the Scandinavian nations, right? They have decided that they are going to um, they are going to um, I don't like using the word bury because then that conjures up something that it is not, but they're going to safely store it away from um, the environment that we are utilizing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And they went about it a different way. They um, basically did a call. Who would like to have the, the, the nuclear waste management component in their in their backyards, 
right? And um, then they were looking at the environmental um, structure in those particular areas to make a decision. And they placed it in an argument of um, the winning town, city, right, area will have economic benefit for years to come, right, in way of um, there is an economy that is generated through the management of, of, of nuclear waste spent fuel. For those that did not, then we're looking at other ways of economic revitalization or continuation in those areas. So that is the Scandinavian kind of model. The U.S. took a different approach. They decided that um, it owned land next to, and I put owned in, in quotes, land near the Nevada test site. And that is where um, the uh, National Repository. Now, of course, there were scientific um, evaluations made of uh, six or seven sites around the United States. And this one kind of floated to the top in way of, of the variables necessary. You didn't have that initial community discussion and that that re resulted in court cases, advocates in way of um, politicians saying, not in my backyard, not when I still have breath, right? Um, so the There would be railroad tracks, you can go in there. Because it was a one through um, a process, there is still energy within that byproduct. And at a later date, we may want to uh, close the fuel cycle and reprocess, so we want to still have access to it. Saying all of that, they did not, so here is where land is seems to be stable but it's not stable, right? Because you have your residents of, of Nevada as a whole saying, wait, a, hold on, we don't, I'm not using this technology, but you wanna use our, um, our land as a garbage dump and what that evokes. And then also you have the Shoshone peoples, um, the indigenous um, First Nations peoples who have contested that, that even in Nevada test site, it's our land. And we've been fighting you for years, decades, right? Centuries um, that we want it back. Of course, after you clean it up, right? Um, and that has been, you know, been contested in courts because of treaty signatures that were not um, abided by. And then here we are again coming into Nevada and in saying that there's going to be a national repository on sacred land. So it just shows the, that a stable structure, a stable land structure property is not, on, it is not stable, it's made stable. And that there is all these contestations that are, are happening with it. Um, so that was off the table. It's off the table right now. When Obama came into office, he, he, um, he stopped movement in that direction to open this repository and set up a, a Blue Ribbon Commission um, for revisiting of that. Um, the approach taken within the United States right now is that where it's produced, the spent fuel is where it stays. So you have a number of the utilities at their site. They have um, open pools um, within the structure. And then uh, it's moved in onto these dry canisters. Um, in some parts of the United States, there are regional repositories. Um, they're to be temporary, right? Um, so 
you have the spent fuel being located in those particular area in those particular area areas right now. So that's how the United States has handled it to date. They're revisiting the Scandinavian model. Can that be brought to the United States so that uh, you identify locations that will be technologically, scientifically stable um, for these structures and then have those, those regions bid for, for lack of a better word, having it in their backyard. So a little bit more inclusionary starting at the beginning as opposed to the failed national repository effort. I don't think I've heard it before, but uh, really interesting stuff there, Lisa, uh, especially Nevada. Um, let, let me entertain one more question, probably just for the interest of time. I know it's uh, uh, morning for you here, um, for you, morning for you there and evening for us here. But there is this question that's very interesting to, um, it says here that um, uh, it, the Philippines is considered one of the countries with less emissions. And yet there is a continuing discourse on the revival of a nuclear power plant. And uh, this was during the president, uh, the former di dictator's plan for the, it's called the Bataan nuclear power plant, right? right. So, so right. the question is what discourses are there at the global level in terms of those areas that are considered or appropriate or priority for nuclear power plant construction? Do you, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so it's easier to build where there is one already, or there is some, some infrastructure, either research and development, um, a laboratory, laboratories. Um, you have companies that are part of the supply chain to begin with, right? Um, so around the world, there are those particular locations. Um, they're primarily in um, Europe, where you look at Eastern Europe or Western Europe, North America. You have a few countries in South America as well, where um, there have been discussions and continuing research that has been happening. You also see that in um, certain parts of Asia, right? Um, where there is an infrastructure or there is a growing infrastructure. You're having your scientists and engineers that are going abroad to study and they're returning home and they're helping to establish that, that technical community and the drive to um, have nuclear as part of the energy, of the energy portfolio. Um, and then there are other nations that have the fuel, right? So I look through the African continent, in particular Gabon. So Gabon has been supplying um, France with its fuel for its nuclear industry, but does not have a nuclear power plant. So there is that wish by some of these African nations to say, hey, wait a minute, um, we've got the raw material, um, we have a need to do that um, kind of leapfrogging and the technology that is coming of age, which is less capital intensive, um, doesn't have as long a, um, uh, a construction timeline, we want to do that. So you're seeing it in those types of locations internationally. Thank you, thank you. Um, and there, any other last many, maybe comments from the floor? Okay. Um, I guess, thank you for, for the responses. Awesome. It you is not clear what... cut, which is, which it, you know, as we do our research, nothing is clear cut, right? Um, right. So it's 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 fascinating to me. And then from my position, I think I'm able to see quicker 
and to understand from the proponent's perspective what what it, does it take to have a nuclear enterprise, right? And then how does one have it at the same level as what fossil fuels has had or uh, what um, the renewables are beginning to have, right? Um, and then how then do you engage with the general public as a whole? So it's exciting times. We ask certain questions and, and it, it would be nice to have a clear cut answer, but um, what fun would that be in way of research, right? So it, when I look at the nuclear, there's the nuclear industry, um, the nuclear enterprise, um, I've only looked at a slice of it, looking at nuclear energy. Um, I can easily look at um, co-production. I can easily look at medicine. I can easily look at other components of it, right? I could look at the fuel source, which then leads you into uranium and thorium and other fuel sources. Um, uh, does the supply itself and then the back end? And I have kind of looked at the back end in, with Yucca Mountain uh, in particular, but there's much more there that needs to be researched. Interesting project for you, Lisa. Uh, I'm sure this is going to figure prominently in the <laughs> in the research you're undertaking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we will be hearing more from that too. And thank you very much for gracing not only our webinar uh, this early morning for you, late evening for us, Bye. but also because you provided us with with, uh, as I said earlier, a kind of multifaceted dimension of nuclear energy and also the pros and cons and also being you as a scholar, a critical geographer who studies this and being part of the industry or being part of the academe, uh, especially in the nuclear engineering department where it's uh, usually um, uh, the preparation for students and practitioners before they engage in in the work that they do. So thank you very much for that, Lisa. And uh, I you. guess many of us are, are really thankful for, for the insights you've imparted us. Um, at this point, uh, we would like to give you a kind of certificate of appreciation. We do this all the time, oh, Lisa. So yeah, you. we do this. Yeah, uh, Kiki likes it too. <laughs> and then oh, Vitra. So. It. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We don't have this in North Carolina. So here we No, do this not at all. all. <laughs> we do this is what we do, and we love doing this. A certificate of appreciation is presented to you for the valuable insights and expertise shared as virtual resource speaker, speaker for the talk, the second nuclear, modern nuclear renaissance in the making, positioning nuclear climate change and infrastructure. For the geography webinar, notice the way we spell webinar. Uh, Colloquium series. Now, <laughs> uh, given this 26th day of November, it's, it's rare that your date is the same as ours, considering we're 13 <laughs> hours ahead. Signed by yours truly and the coordinator for the geography webinar. Thank you. Oh, the spelling Dominique. of webinar there is no change. Uh, geography webinar colloquium series, Dominique Sasha Amor Solo.